Episode 2 The Victim, Elizabeth Short Now that Jane Doe No. 1 had a name, she also had a history. Who was she? What was her story? What brought her on her collision course with death? Born in Hyde Park, Massachusetts on July 29, 1924 to parents Phoebe May and Cleo Short. Elizabeth was the third of what would become a family of five children, all girls. One, Virginia, called Ginny. Two, Dorothea. Three, Elizabeth. Four, Eleonora. Five, Muriel. Before Elizabeth's birth, Cleo had owned a successful car repair shop in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. Reluctantly, he relocated the family to the Hyde Park neighborhood of Boston, Massachusetts so that Phoebe could be near her family. There, Cleo started his second successful business venture, designing and building miniature golf courses. As the business prospered, the family moved to Medford, Massachusetts. Mary Passios stated in her book, Childhood Shadows. The miniature course he built at Howard Johnson's Circle was considered one of the best around, a real moneymaker, bringing in other jobs. Betty's mother was the bookkeeper and ran the office. They could afford new oak furniture, a new dark blue Ford, and singing and violin lessons for their eldest daughter, Ginny. The success of the Roaring Twenties continued and the family grew by two more daughters, but all was not well in the short family. Elizabeth suffered from asthma and frequent bouts with bronchitis, conditions only worsened by the cold New England weather. Then, in October 1929, Cleo Short's business, Luck, ran out. The stock market crashed and the Great Depression devastated the hopes and dreams of millions. The miniature golf fad that had fueled Cleo Short's success came to a screeching halt. Businesses lucky enough to stay afloat couldn't or didn't dare invest in custom-designed golf courses. With so many mouths to feed, Elizabeth's frail health, no business prospects, and thinking only of himself, Cleo parked his car on the Charlestown Bridge and flew the coop. Most, including Phoebe, thought he ended it all by jumping into the Charles River. In reality, he went to California. After their father vanished, Elizabeth developed emotional problems and mood swings. Phoebe said. She was happy one moment, sad the next. I guess she was what you would call a manic depressive. Abandoned with five mouths to feed, Phoebe moved the family from their spacious two-story home to a smaller house on Evans Street. When the landlord raised the rent, they moved again to a small flat where they shared two bedrooms until Phoebe converted a sun porch into a third bedroom. After another rent hike, they moved once again to an apartment on Salem Street. Luckily, Phoebe's experience bookkeeping for the golf course business provided occasional employment, but mother's aid and government handouts more often than not kept a roof over their heads, food in their stomachs, shoes on their feet, and nightgowns made from flower sacks to sleep in. Finally, Phoebe got a full-time job as a clerk for the Mystic Bakery, working six days a week. To escape the grim reality, Phoebe took the girls, especially Muriel and Elizabeth, to the movies. There they could get lost in a fantasy world, at least for a couple hours. Often they would dress up in their finest clothes and window shop, hoping that someday they could afford what now they could only look at. The short girls would often talk and daydream about Hollywood. Beth's sisters believed that she would one day make it big. Beth had a good singing voice that the family and neighbors who heard her compared to Deanna Durbin. But these were only dreams spun in the mind of a girl prone to fantasy, who would go on to concoct stories, talking about big dreams that in the end would turn out just to be talk. Then, Beth's health got worse. One year, she missed 36 days of school, and she required numerous medical treatments. Her sisters, Virginia and Muriel, also had asthma, but their cases were not as severe. Muriel recounted. She had asthma like me and Ginny, but sometimes she had it worse than we did. Sometimes the three of us would be sitting up all night struggling to breathe. We'd take turns sitting in the rocking chair, but when it got bad, Mama would have to call the doctor. 
but what was bad was about to get worse. At 15, Beth developed pleurisy, an inflammation of the thin layer of tissue that lines the lungs and chest wall. This would require a lung operation in which one of Beth's ribs would be removed. This operation would also leave Beth with a distinctive eye-shaped scar. As Elizabeth turned 16, her asthma and bronchitis worsened. To spare her from the cold, damp, New England winters, Phoebe sent Beth to live with family friends in Florida. She spent the winter of 1940 living in Miami Beach working as a waitress. In a warmer climate, Beth's health started to improve. She spent much of her time at the beach, soaking up the warm sun. For the next two years, Beth would leave Medford in the fall and return in the spring. Elizabeth had already been attracting male attention before her trips to Florida. But upon each spring return, and her growing confidence and maturity, the local men, and women, noticed the changes. Mary Pasios said Beth had a way of attracting attention using her distinctive walk. In her book, Childhood Shadows, she related. My aunt Dut thought it was a wonder we didn't have more car accidents when Bet walked down the street. The way those guys crane their heads out the window. She said to my mother. The neighborhood women always stopped what they were doing to watch Bet. They laughed about the way men looked at Bet and fell over themselves. Bet doesn't miss a step, even in platform shoes, my aunt said. She carries herself straight and tall, just like a model, swinging and swaying all the way up Salem Street. In another statement Pasios would describe Beth's walk as Everybody in Medford remembered Betty's walk. A slow and sensuous sachet of the hips, which had cars jamming their brakes on Salem Street. Family friend, Eleanor Kurz, noticed Beth at a local restaurant. I remember I hadn't seen Betty in a while, and she was sitting very straight on the stool farthest from the door, dressed to the minute in a leopard fur coat and hat. She made me feel like a country bumpkin. I thought to myself, Dottie's kid sister sure has grown up. Betty had her legs crossed and she wore dark stockings and suede pumps and a lot of makeup by Medford standards. She was in her teens, but looked older, sophisticated. Eleanor Kurz also noted that Mr. Griffin, the restaurant owner who was in his fifties, had taken a liking to Beth. Some people said that Mr. Griffith was Betty's boyfriend. But I think it was just that he wanted to help her in a fatherly way. Perhaps Beth did seek a father figure in her life. After all, she had taken Cleo's disappearance the hardest of all the girls. But Cleo was about to re-enter, or at least try to re-enter the situation. One day, about twelve years after Cleo's disappearance, Phoebe received a letter from her wayward husband. Unable to deal with his financial problems, he had fled to Northern California, where he had found work at the Mare Island shipyards in Vallejo, California. He begged Phoebe to forgive him and allow him to return. But Cleo was dead to her. She had already accepted his death and no longer considered him her husband. His pleas for forgiveness fell upon deaf ears. However, when Beth found out her father was still alive, she was more forgiving. They developed a correspondence, and in time, Cleo offered to send her train fare so that she could join him in Vallejo. She could get a part-time job and cook and keep house for him. Beth arrived in December 1942, but things didn't work out as planned. And soon father and daughter had trouble getting along. Beth was only in Vallejo a short time before she and her father traveled to Los Angeles, California with a Mrs. Yank and stayed for three weeks in January 1943. There, their growing conflict intensified. He had a problem with her dating habits and late hours out on the town. And Beth had a problem with her father's drinking. Due to their differences, Beth found herself kicked out and on her own in an area new to her, without any friends or other family nearby. After meeting a Sergeant Chuck, who offered to take her to a place where she could find possible employment, she found her way to a job at Camp Cook Army Base near Lompoc, in Santa Barbara County, California. There, she was fingerprinted and given a photo ID. It wasn't long before she was named the new 
Camp Cutie. Inez Keeling, a fellow employee of Camp Cook PX No. 1, recalled that Beth had childlike charm and beauty. She was one of the loveliest girls I had ever seen. The Camp newspaper declared her the main reason for the steady increase of business at PX No. 1. Though she was popular, word soon got around to look but don't touch. She was cute as all get out, but she wasn't putting out for anyone. Although she was a civilian employee, she was entitled to camp housing. However, due to a shortage of housing, she accepted an offer from Sergeant Chuck, who said she could stay at his place. But Beth wasn't prepared to pay Sergeant Chuck's rent. When he didn't get what he wanted, he beat her, giving her a black eye. Even though Beth filed a complaint, any charges for damages were denied, and Sergeant Chuck was soon shipped overseas. Facing unemployment due to civilian job cutbacks, Beth moved to a bunkhouse at a ranch in Casmalia, California. But when no prospects opened there, she found a place at Vera Green's apartment on Montecito Street in Santa Barbara. There, another fateful event would transpire on September 23, 1943. She was with a party of soldiers and other girls at a restaurant when things started getting loud. Police came and broke things up. Beth was never a heavy drinker, so it's not known how much she had, if any, but at 19 years old in 1943, she was still considered underage to be on her own without a parent or legal guardian. Taken into custody, she was charged as a minor where liquor was being served. Then she was booked, fingerprinted, and photographed. A policewoman, Mary Uncafer, didn't see Beth as being a troublemaker. She had just been in the wrong place, at the wrong time, and with the wrong crowd. Beth could not return to Vera Green's apartment because a soldier was living with Vera out of wedlock, unacceptable living conditions for an underage girl in 1943. Until Beth's charges could be ruled on, policewoman Uncafer took custody of her as her temporary ward. Officer Uncafer noted that Beth had a red rose tattooed on her left leg. Beth loved to sit so that it would show. Through all of this, Cleo refused to take Beth in. With nowhere to go, Beth was sent back to Medford to live with her mother. Officer Uncafer drove Beth to the bus depot, gave her ten dollars of her own money, and explained that there would be no police reports of the incident sent to Massachusetts so Beth didn't have to worry about telling her mother. She also gave her a warning. But it won't be a good idea for you to come back to Santa Barbara and get yourself into any more trouble. What we're giving you is a warning. Uncafer also remembered Beth's response. She looked at me with those wonderful eyes and said, I'm sorry about the trouble. She was so pretty and had a heart so set on staying in California being in the movies. I suggested she wait a couple of years, then give California another try. Too bad for Beth that she took Officer Uncafer's advice. Back in Medford, Beth did keep secret her arrest. And things pretty much went back to the way things were before her California trip. Still, she hated the New England winters and went back to wintering in Florida. During her winters in Florida, Beth dated often, mostly servicemen. Friend Sharon Given said. She was a natural vamp. One who brings out the wolf in all the men, no exceptions. And she didn't even have to try. It was during her Florida visits that she met the two great loves of her life. The first was Gordon Fickling in September 1944. A young lieutenant colonel who flew B-24 bombers. Although they broke up before he was shipped out to Europe, they kept up a correspondence and friendship. The second was Major Matt Gordon, who served with the United States Army Air Force in the CBI, China-Burma-India Theater with the famed Flying Tigers. He then served with the 1st Fighter Squadron, 2nd Air Commando Group of the 10th Air Force, was a credited ace with five confirmed kills, and was awarded the Silver Star, Bronze Star, and Distinguished Service Cross. Although the names Gordon Fickling and Matt Gordon come up most often as Beth's main men, Matt Gordon seemed to have made the most impression on her and whose death in a plane crash seems to have been the catalyst that sent Beth into a downward spiral and possible break with reality. 
she met Matt Gordon on New Year's Eve 1944. In years to come, Beth would claim she and Gordon were married and that they even had a child who died. This would become one of the sob stories she used to garner sympathy for free meals or a place to stay. It is possible, but debated, whether they had even been engaged. Whatever the truth of the matter, their romance ended on August 10, 1945, when Matt Gordon died in a plane crash. After Matt Gordon's death, Beth returned to her wayward dating, but she also took up a renewed correspondence with Gordon Fickling. Beth spent some time in Chicago in July 1946, where she may have met Fickling and rekindled their romance. Regardless of how, when, where, or why, she got back with him. We are now about to get to the point in Beth's life ere things would send her down an ever-darkening path that would lead her deeper and deeper towards doom. She was about to be ensnared in the myth that would overshadow the reality of her life. To keep things as brief as possible and stick to the biography aspects of this episode, some of the more important players, places, and incidents only briefly described here will be explored in greater detail in future episodes. In July of 1946, Beth made her fateful move to Los Angeles to be near Gordon Fickling, who was now stationed in Long Beach. Fickling would pay her way, sometimes living with her, checking her into the Washington Hotel on Linden Avenue. Then, he rented her a furnished apartment. It was in Long Beach that Beth's reputation grew, and reality began twisting into legend, for it was in Long Beach that Elizabeth Short became the Black Dahlia. Probably inspired by the 1946 film, The Blue Dahlia, starring Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake, the employees and patrons of a neighborhood drugstore started calling Beth the Black Dahlia behind her back, possibly due to her very dark hair and because she often wore black dresses, although not nearly as often as portrayed in myth. Beth's destiny seemed to be playing out without her being in any control, as if the thread of life spun by the fates was leading her to death like a leash leading an unknowing dog to slaughter by a cruel master. When she wasn't with Fickling, she would walk the neighborhood, visiting local bars, restaurants, and nightclubs, perhaps sometimes out of boredom, but always out of necessity. Without a job or regular source of income, Beth needed to eat. Dressing up in her best clothes, and using the same eye-catching walk that had turned so many heads in Medford, she transformed herself into an alluring creature that men coveted but could not have. If men got too forward, she gave them her fictional sob story about being a war widow and mother whose child had died. This got her free meals and a few sympathetic bucks to pay bills and live off of. But she never led men too far. She always told them she wasn't looking for a lover, but that didn't keep men from wanting her. Some people seem to want most what they cannot have. This behavior drove the men closest to her to jealousy. In a later interview, Gordon Fickling said that the thought of Beth kissing other men drove him crazy. But as the last few months of her life ticked away, the lines of reality and the perceived realities of others blurred into hearsay and pure fiction. She was always seen making the rounds at bars and nightclubs, but she rarely drank, and when she did, it was only light social drinking. She was always seen with different men, possibly hundreds, over the course of the last six months of her life. She had always dated frequently, but she was not the prostitute or high-class escort that the locals rumored her to be. In fact, after her death, investigators could only confirm that she had three lovers. When asked about her plans or dreams, she claimed to be an aspiring actress who had already been cast in bit parts or on the verge of a big break. But in reality, she had never tried out for a part or sought representation from an agent, manager, or publicist. She had done some modeling, mostly hat modeling, but the closest thing to professional portfolio headshots she had ever done was posing for pictures outside of Marshall High School. Her lack of acting experience could not have simply been an outsider not knowing how to break into a competitive industry. During her last months in Los Angeles, she would know and even be roommates with aspiring actresses who were already bit players. 
Many of the nightclubs she frequented were popular hangouts of Hollywood insiders and had floor shows highlighting the talents of young starlets and even future stars. Sadly, such establishments would also be magnets for more unsavory characters, including members of the Mafia. Some of the club owners and managers also employed opportunists or low-level thugs looking to bed the young starlets, some who were underage. Some of these club owners or managers themselves had less than noble motives. Some harbored obsessive motives for Beth. And, sadly, in Beth's desperation she couldn't tell the difference between a helping hand and a hand with ulterior motives. Beth's already bad luck was about to get worse. Gordon Fickling stopped paying rent on Beth's apartment, although he would remain in friendly communication with her right up till her murder and would even send her frequent monetary donations. The last time Fickling claimed to have seen Beth was August 1946, when on a week's leave soon before his discharge, they checked into the Brevoort Hotel near Vine Street in Hollywood, where they stayed from August 20 to 27, 1946 with Beth registered as his wife. On her own in a strange city and living a hand-to-mouth existence, essentially as close to true homelessness as one can get without actually being on the street, on August 28, Beth checked into the Hawthorne Hotel. Here, a mysterious figure, a short, dark man described as being between 35 to 40 years old, who drove a 1936 or 1937 Black Ford often paid Beth's rent when she was short of cash, which was most of the time. At the Hawthorne, Beth had two roommates, Marjorie Graham and Lynn Martin. Graham had known Beth in Boston, where they both worked as waitresses in the same establishment. They met by chance on the Hollywood Boulevard earlier that month. Lynn Martin, whose real name was Norma Lee Meyer, was a 16-year-old runaway. Marjorie and Lynn dated Harold Costa and Donald Leyes. Costa recounted, Whenever we took the girls out to dinner, they always asked us if they might bring Beth along. They said the kid was broke and hungry. Many times when Beth couldn't tag along on dates with the girls or find her own date, she would go hungry. Marjorie said, Most of the time, if she didn't go out on dates, she wasn't eating. Another fateful encounter happened at the popular Florentine Gardens when she met club manager Mark Hansen. Afterwards, Lynn Martin recalled Beth telling her, If you were just a little older, I'd introduce you to Mark because he has clubs all over town and all he'd have to do is pick up a phone and you'd be singing in one of the clubs. But unless you have some sort of consent form from a guardian, you're going to get yourself in trouble along with the people that hire you. In reality, it was unlikely Mark Hansen would have cared about Lynn Martin's age. The director of the Florentine Gardens floor show, Nils Thor Granlund, also known as NTG, was notorious for recruiting Hollywood hopeful girls from around the country. In 1944, NTG hired the underage sisters, Jean and Dean Stull. However, the Florentine Gardens floor show did help launch the careers of Betty Hutton, Jean Wallace, Lily St. Cyr, Mary the Body MacDonald, and Yvonne DiCarlo, who would one day play Lily Munster on The Munsters. Much more will be said about Mark Hansen, the Florentine Gardens, and Hansen's cohorts in a later episode. It is possible that Beth knew Hansen for some time before she mentioned him to Lynn. On September 28, Beth checked out of the Hawthorne. Picking her up was none other than her mysterious patron, the short, dark-complexioned man who drove a 36 or 37 Black Ford. From the Hawthorne, the mystery man drove her to 6024 Carlos Avenue, located behind the Florentine Gardens, the residence of Mark Hansen, and one of the rooming houses he owned and allowed the floor showgirls to stay. Being his personal residence, the Carlos Avenue bungalow was where he housed his favorite girls. It was also well known that the Mafia controlled a piece of the Florentine Gardens pie. Beth's life was about to fall from the frying pan into the fire. Although Beth stayed there, she never officially worked at the Florentine Gardens or performed in the floor show. It is possible she worked as a B-girl tasked to keep the patrons spending money on drinks. Hansen was a married man with two daughters, but that didn't keep him from playing around with any girl the middle-aged man could get. 
At the time Beth stayed at his bungalow, he was involved in an open relationship with Hollywood bit player and Toth. But there was something about Beth that drew him to her like a moth to a flame. And Toth said. Mark really liked Beth. He had a yen for her. The more Beth resisted Hansen, the more he wanted her. She even resorted to telling him what had worked with other amorous men in the past, that she was a virgin, did not cool him off. He tried to win her with gifts, even hiring a seamstress to make her two dresses. The thing that finally started turning Hansen off was Beth's continuing habit of dating as many men as she could. Then Marjorie Graham found her way to Hansen's home, and his dislike of Graham may have added a further dampening effect on his lust for Beth. Because Graham and Beth were friends, Hansen decided to throw both of them out. He would later tell police. This, Graham girl. She was always liquored up, and I didn't like it at all. And this short girl, she had always got some undesirable-looking character waiting for her outside and bringing her home. Getting kicked out on October 10, the girls shacked up with Bill Robinson and Marvin Margolis, a pre-med student at USC, at the Guardian Arms Apartments on Hollywood Boulevard. Things there did not work out for long. While Margolis and Robinson both slept with Graham in the bed, Beth slept on the couch. But later Beth would confide in and Toth, telling her that she was dating Margolis. Trying to get back in Hansen's favor, Beth told him that she and Margolis were cousins. When Robinson wanted to try for a piece of the action, Beth denied him and he punched her in the face. Soon after, Margolis dropped Beth's and Marjorie's luggage off at Hansen's place and told him they were going back to Boston. Although Marjorie did return to Massachusetts, Beth conned her way into getting Hansen to let her stay. Still, Beth refused to quit dating so many men, reigniting the jealous rage felt by Hansen. To get around his anger, Beth would meet her dates down the block. When Hansen found a call to Gordon Fickling charged on his phone bill, he finally blew his stack. But Beth wasn't entirely innocent in her dealings with Hansen. When Hansen brought home a new girl, Beth's own jealous streak showed. And Toth, who by now must have been used to sharing Hansen with others, said Beth called the girl a tramp. And said. She had a lot of high ideas, that Betty, believe me, with her Boston family and all that stuff. She got up and locked her suitcase, because she thought this girl was going to get into her suitcase, and the other girl said I don't want to touch your damn suitcase. I don't want anything in there. Anyway words were flying back and forth and there was a beef and a fist fight, and Mark stepped in between them. That was the final straw. Mark threw Beth out in the morning. And helped Beth find a new place to stay. This time, Beth moved into the Chancellor Apartments on North Cherokee. There, Beth rented a bed for a dollar a night in apartment 501 along with eight other girls and collected any mail received at Hansen's and delivered it to Beth at the Chancellor. Toth said. I got it before Mark got to it, because he might have wanted to keep it or something. Elizabeth didn't want me to let him get a hold of it. Beth didn't like the living arrangements at the Chancellor. She didn't seem to like the other girls either. Mrs. Juanita Ringo, the apartment manager said. She wasn't sociable like the other girls who lived in apartment 501 with her. Apartment 501 roommate, Linda Rohr, said. She had a lot of telephone calls, mostly from a man named Maurice, and she was out almost every night. Maintaining her friendship with Anne, Beth would occasionally return to Hansen's bungalow. Once, Hansen came home to find Beth and then having dinner and overheard Beth saying that she was scared and feared she had moved in with some bad company. In early December, Beth's financial problems hit rock bottom. Juanita Ringo said. I don't think she had a job. That night she got the money somewhere and left the next morning. Linda Rohr added. The morning she left, she was very anxious. She said, I've got to hurry, he's waiting for me. We never found out who he was. She was supposed to go to live with her sister in Berkeley. Who was this man waiting for Beth? Was he the mysterious benefactor who sometimes paid her bills? 
Some have suggested the man was Maurice Clement, and Linda Rohr confirmed a man named Maurice did frequently call Beth. But we will look into this in a later episode. On December 8, 1946, 22 year old Dorothy French, an employee of the Aztec Theater in San Diego, California, found Beth sleeping in the theater. French took pity on the exhausted woman and decided to offer her a room in the home she shared with her mother, Elvira, and brother, Corey. Dorothy said, There was something sorrowful about her. She seemed lost and a stranger to the area. And I felt I wanted to help her. I wasn't sure how. She apparently had no place to stay. I suggested she come home with me and get a good night's sleep, if that would help. She said she was thankful for my generosity. They climbed on a bus for the half-hour ride to the French home in the Pacific Beach area. Dorothy recalled. Beth didn't say much. She seemed sad, like someone with no one to turn to. I was taking her to my house for a place to sleep, but I felt like she was all by herself on the bus. When they reached the French residence, Elvira noted Beth's pale complexion and that she had a cough. What the Frenches didn't know as Beth fell almost immediately asleep on their couch was that Dorothy's expected one night of charity would last a month. More about Beth's stay with the Frenches will be discussed in a later episode, but suffice it to say, Beth quickly wore out her welcome, sleeping late on the couch and strewing her clothes around. Elvira noted this about their guest. There was a strong, sweet-smelling scent in the house from her perfume. It was as though she had sprinkled perfume everywhere. She hadn't of course. It was just her way of using it. Her clothes looked quite expensive, especially the lingerie. There were brand new black silk stockings. I could tell they were not nylon, but silk. Dorothy tried to get Beth a job at the Aztec, but when Beth met the manager, she left with him on a date that lasted until 2 a.m. This new romance led to a strange occurrence. Invited to the manager's house for shish kebab, Beth said she was given too much to drink. And the manager became aggressive, grabbing her and scratching her arms. Dorothy noticed the scratches. I was puzzled about that. Beth had long, red scratches on her upper arms, and she said the manager told her he was in love with her, and that is what he would do to her if she stepped out on him. During her time with the Frenches, Beth exchanged several letters with Gordon Fickling, asking him for money and trying to rekindle their romance. Beth wrote, Have we been foolish? Is there something we could share? Is there something, some way we could be happy? Fickling responded, My feelings for you are such that I'm afraid that if we spend any more time together, I am going to be falling in love with you all over again, and it will be the same problem we have faced before. I know you care deeply for me, and you know that I care for you. I do not know if there can be any future in it at all. You want us to be good friends. I want nothing more than that. Are you sure what you really want? You've got to be just a little more practical these days. I'm glad you have ambition to be a cover girl. You deserve to be a success. After all, you have a lot to work with. You know how I feel about you, but I don't think I can simply be good friends with you since I care so much about you. I don't know what we can do about it. I am worried about you. I am concerned about you. I will try to help you in all ways and any way that I can, but Beth, Beth, please understand that no matter how much my caring for you is, I cannot be optimistic about a future together. As Beth's options with Fickling flickered out, the Frenches were also debating whether Beth was still welcome. Dorothy said. My mother and I had a couple of arguments. You just couldn't tell someone to go away once you asked them to stay. At least Gordon Fickling came through with some cash, sending her a hundred dollars. The fresh donation gave the Frenches more room to debate whether it was time to send Beth on her way. Elvira was at the end of her rope tiptoeing around Beth's late sleeping habits on her way to work and having to step around Beth's growing pile of clothes. Not to mention worrying about what impression Beth's lingerie was making on young Corey. 
and Beth had still not made a real effort to find a job or move out on her own. Dorothy and Elvira soon began to wonder if Beth was hiding out from something or someone. Elvira said. She seemed constantly in fear of something. Whenever anybody came to the door, she would act frightened. With Fickling's hundred in her pocket, Beth had the funds to move, but she still needed a way out. About a week before Christmas 1946, she met the way out. And that out was Robert, Red, Manley. Although married with a beautiful wife and recently born child, Red wanted something more out of life. He needed a little temptation to spice things up and see if he was still in love with his wife, as they were in an adjustment period in their marriage. He had never been a strong-willed or adventurous type. He was given a Section 8 from the Army for being high-strung and nervous under pressure and the routine restrictions of military discipline. You'd think Red had served in a high-risk combat unit, but in reality he had been in an army band. There will be much, much more about Red in a future episode, but for now we'll explore a shortened version of the events. Red met Beth on the street corner in front of the Western Airlines office. Red said, I decided to pick up Miss Short to make a real test for myself and see if I loved my wife or not. Red offered Beth a ride home. She accepted and also accepted his offer of a date. When Beth excitedly told the Frenches about her new man, she spun another of her tall tales. In her fantasy, the milquetoast Manley had been a pilot in the Marines who was now flying for Western Airlines. Their one date turned into going out every night between the 16th and 21st of December 1946 before he returned to his wife and child. However, Beth and Red were not through with each other yet. They maintained a correspondence. And Beth told him to contact her if he was in the area. On January 7, 1947 Red wired Beth, telling her he would be in San Diego on the 8th for business. Beth now had her way out. But she must have been making other arrangements in case Red didn't come through. Beth had made no secret of her staying with the Frenches. She used their mailing address, sending and receiving letters to and from her mother and Gordon Fickling. She also used the neighbor's phone to make and receive calls. Now Red knew her whereabouts and contact information. Who else had she given the French's address to? Others did know, and they were coming to call. The night before Beth left the French home to return to Los Angeles, loud knocking on the door disturbed the household. Beth watched a trio of two men and a woman through the window, but she refused to answer the door. She just watched fearfully until they left, and then she became relieved. Dorothy recalled the incident. She was terribly frightened and refused to talk about them. She was evasive when I asked other questions, so I gave up. Beth moved out of the French home on January 8, 1947. Red picked her up, and Beth asked him to take her to a phone. After she made a call, Beth confirmed that Red would give her a ride back to Los Angeles. They drove to the Hacienda Club in Mission Valley, only about a 15-minute drive from the French home. Red still had business planned for the 9th, so the Los Angeles trip would have to wait till the next day. Red said there was no affection between them during the night. Beth spent the night in a chair, feeling cold and suffering from chills. But we will look at the events and timeline of Beth's last LA trip in another episode. On January 9, 1947, Red finished his business meeting, returned to the hacienda, and picked up Beth, who was feeling better. She was dressed and ready to go, wearing a black collarless suit, a fluffy white silk blouse, white gloves, black suede high heel shoes, and carrying a black handbag. Beth acted strangely during the drive. She talked little and searched the other vehicles, as if looking for some person or persons she was terrified of seeing. For some time now, Beth had been frightened of something or someone. Ever since Gordon Fickling had stopped payment on her apartment, she had been drifting from place to place. She had had at least two obsessive suitors, Mark Hansen and the Aztec theater owner, or at least Beth blamed the scratches on her arms to the manager, 
although scratches were indeed confirmed by Dorothy and Elvira French. Bill Robinson had punched her in the face. She had gotten into an altercation with one of Hanson's girls. She hadn't gotten along with some of her many roommates over the course of the last several months, and thought some belonged to a bad crowd. She had a mysterious benefactor named Maurice who drove her around and sometimes paid her bills. Two men and a woman found her at the French residence in San Diego, a trio that Beth had seemed terrified of. Why was she watching the other cars with apprehension? Beth's time was running out. Sadly, the end of her road was now just down the street. The Biltmore Hotel was looming ahead. Beth had told Red another lie about meeting her sister, Virginia, at the Biltmore. But she hadn't spoken with Virginia in some time, and definitely was not meeting her at the hotel. She even told him this was her first time in Los Angeles. Before having Red drop her off at the Biltmore, she had checked her bags at the Greyhound bus depot just in case Ginny was late. She even suggested Red just leave her at the depot. But why would she ask to be left at the bus depot if she was supposed to meet Virginia at the Biltmore? Had Beth planned on skipping out with Fickling's hundred dollars? Maybe her intent had been to go to the Greyhound Depot all along. The Biltmore story might have been a lie just to help her cover her tracks whatever her intentions were, they were Beth's and Beth's alone to know. She had already woven a web of lies so thick that it was doubtful even she knew the real truth anymore, if she had at all since the death of Matt Gordon. If Red had been sharper, he might have seen through the holes in the tail Beth was feeding him. But sadly, Red didn't seem like the sharpest tool in the shed, only one good enough to get her where she needed to go, or where she thought she needed to go. Besides, Red had just been thinking with his little head ever since he met Beth. But Red thought the bus station was too bad a part of town to leave Beth. He insisted she go to the classy Biltmore. Once there, Red checked the front desk to see if Ginny had left any messages while Beth used the restroom. Red delivered Beth the news that Ginny had left no messages. But of course, Beth already knew that. He waited until about 6.30 p.m. and decided it was time to get back home to his family. They said their goodbyes. Red never saw Beth again. At least alive. The Biltmore Hotel Bell Captain, Harold Studholm said Beth waited in the lobby for several hours and made a few phone calls. At about 10 p.m., she left through the Olive Street exit. That was the last confirmed sighting of Elizabeth Short, although there are unconfirmed sightings during what would be known as Beth's missing week, and we will look at those sightings in another episode. What is confirmed is that Betty Berzinger found Beth's bisected corpse on the morning of January 15, 1947. Episode End Notes Even as I make these episodes, the investigation is ongoing. Occasionally, I will make end notes to clarify something or add information. 1. Some sources state that Mark Ann and Toth were in a relationship. Others state that she was just living at his house and that they were not involved. It is well known that Mark Hansen had a habit of betting many of the girls who stayed with him. After seeing photos of Antoth, I can see of no reason why he wouldn't have been interested in her. Many sources state Toth had a boyfriend named Leo Himes who was involved with her while she was staying with Hansen. Whatever the truth of the matter, I leave it to you, the viewer, to come to your own conclusion. Also, Fickling's full name was Joseph Gordon Fickling. Many sources state him as Gordon Fickling. I have usually referred to him as Gordon for that reason, as it is not uncommon for some to go by their middle name for whatever reason. And some sources state Fickling's rank as lieutenant and others as lieutenant colonel. Fickling's find a grave site states he was a lieutenant colonel. You can find the link below. It was not uncommon during wartime for younger men to achieve a higher rank than they normally would have achieved in peacetime during the same length of service. Beth's other boyfriend, Matt Gordon, 
was a major at the time of his death.